the target is being so impacted by the heart and mind of Christ that our internal world becomes healthy. And when my internal world becomes healthy, it affects everything about my life. My physical health, my mental health, emotional health. It affects um, my finances. It affects my worldview. Everything is impacted by, by what I allow to go on in here, in my heart of hearts. Welcome, welcome. Glad uh, that you're able to join us once again. We just call this the quest for wisdom. Uh, the need has never been greater for a people to rise up in the earth with the wisdom of God, because the wisdom of God brings solutions, and we've never been more surrounded with challenges or problems uh, than we have been uh, in, in recent years. So anyway, welcome to the quest for wisdom. I, I have forgotten to mention this in previous weeks, but uh, I'm doing uh, most all of my study or reading in this uh, series uh, out of the New King James uh, Version. And I, I happen to have the uh, the Holy Spirit uh, filled life Bible uh, that uh, Jack Hayford put together. So many great word studies and stuff. So anyway, it's not a promotional for that, but just to let you know uh, that when I read what I'm reading from, because some of the translations are quite diverse and uh, each tends to add uh, a nuance or a flavor that uh, can really help us in our pursuit of wisdom. So chapter 14 is where we're starting. And uh, chapter 14 is just pregnant. I was just telling the team here, uh, this is a pregnant chapter. There's so much, so much in here for us. So I'm going to try my best to get through it in the seven or eight minutes uh, that we'll have together to get through as much of it as really is in my heart. So uh, Proverbs chapter 14, I want to begin with verse four. And it's one of my personal favorite, what I call revival verses. Now, you have to understand, um, help me to loosely translate revival verses, because it's not directly talking about an outpouring of the Spirit of God, yet the principles involved in Scripture here, in this book of wisdom, pertain directly to great moves of God. And so here's the verse. We're going to start with chapter 14, verse 4. Where no oxen are, the trough is clean but much increase comes by strength of the ox. Where there's no oxen, the manger, the, the uh, barn area, where there's no oxen, it's clean, it's orderly, everything's perfect. But if you want increase, you have to have a shovel. You gotta get ready to clean up a mess. And I honestly, I don't know of any verse that more accurately describes being involved in great moves of God. Um, there's this notion that some people have that if it's a great move of God, there won't be any problems with it. And that's just not true. Anytime people are involved, you increase the odds of there being complexities and difficulties and conflicts, all the above. And the enemy is a counterfeiter. He's not a creator. And so he likes to counterfeit stuff. And so when you're involved in something that God is doing, uh, a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there will always be opportunity for flesh. There will always be opportunity for the enemy to try to come in and deceive. That's not to make us paranoid. It's just to, it's just to help us to sort through the priorities. If you want to move of God, just be ready to clean up messes. You know, they, they, uh, perhaps you've heard uh, the comparison. Uh, graveyards are nice and orderly. Nurseries where there's lots of babies are really messy. One has life, the other doesn't. And uh, really, moves of God, they just automatically bring challenges to life. And so it really, it forces you to learn how to pray. You know, because I'll I, I tell you, we've gone through seasons where night after night after night, um, God would be doing something so powerful. And we would, we would look at what was happening and just shake our heads. You know, like, is that the Lord? You know, I don't know. I don't know. First of all, it's, it's biblically accurate, but this is so unusual. And we would just shake our heads and, and just kind of measure the fruit over time and come back and say, yeah, that was God. It was amazing. So I want to encourage you. It's a risky but well-deserved journey to embark on, to say, Holy Spirit, come and do as you please. I just want to cooperate with you. So where there's no oxen, it's a clean barn. But if you want to increase, you got to get a shovel. 
got to get ready to clean up messes. So welcome to revival. That's the life of revival. Let's move on through uh, chapter 14. There's so much here. I guess I've already said that. Um, there's so much here that I want to talk about. So let's jump right to verse 7. Go from the presence of a foolish man when you, uh, excuse me, go from the presence of a foolish man when you do not perceive in him the lips of knowledge. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. The folly of fools is deceit. All right, here's the point. Go from the presence of a foolish person when you don't, uh, when you don't perceive uh, that he is speaking truth. He's speaking revelation knowledge. Why? Who you associate with impacts and affects your discernment. The people that you exchange, you do life with, they actually have an impact on your perception of truth. If you constantly give input, and I don't care whether it's your best friend at work or it's the sitcom that you watch on TV, if you continuously expose yourself to things that are not true, it will affect your ability to discern right from wrong, truth from a lie that which is vital to that which is inferior. And so the Lord wants us to be very deliberate in who we associate with. Now, uh, this, is the way I, this is the way I approach it. I will serve and minister to anybody. They, they can be the worst person on the planet. I'm going to love and care for them. But the ones that I allow to speak into my life, to contribute to me, um, that is, is a different story. And I'm going to approach that with much more caution and care. So choose the people that you uh, spend time with carefully. Um, verse 9. Oops, I'm running out of time here. I'm, i got to go fast. You listen fast, I'll talk fast. Verse 9. Fools mock at sin, but among the upright there is favor. Fools mock at sin. This is really a big, big deal. Fools mock at sin. What is it telling us here? I'll tell you what the enemy does to erode godly culture. He's not going to get us overnight to approve of sin. So what does he do? He brings sin into sitcoms, into jokes, into various parts of culture, knowing that if he can get us to laugh at sin, to think sin is humorous, then it weakens our resistance. And so that's what happens. You can look over the last 40 years of TV and the subject matter, and every, every great area of sin that our nation is involved in right now started as an area of humor 20, 30 years ago. And when you, you laugh at sin, when you make light of sin, it ruins, it destroys your resistance, and it affects your discernment. And uh, so that's a, it's, it's, it's a big, big deal for us to be careful as to what we're willing to laugh at, what we are willing to make a part of our own uh, entertainment, if you will. All right, I'm going to move on down here real quickly. Let's see. Let's go right down. Um, let's go right down to verse 27, and we'll, we'll end uh, our, our time uh, on this chapter today. Um, actually, I'm going to do 27 and 20, uh, excuse me, and 30. All right. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. Verse 30. A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. This quest for wisdom is more than let's try to find answers for the world's problems. To me, that's the spillover. That's the uh, that's the the benefit. Uh, it's it's the result, but the target is not that. The target isn't finding, you know, solutions for world peace. The target is being so impacted by the heart and mind of Christ that our internal world becomes healthy. And when my internal world becomes healthy, it affects everything about my life, my physical health, my mental health, emotional health. It affects um, my finances. It affects my worldview. Everything is impacted by, by what I allow to go on in here, in my heart of hearts. So here it is, a sound heart, stable heart, the, that inner world, is life to the body. 
I would encourage you, if, if you're uh, dealing with the health issues uh, at all, go through the book of Proverbs and look at every time there is the decree about our words in our internal world of health, uh, sound, sound mind, sound heart, the internal world having effect on our bodies. And I pray that in this next season, you and I together can learn some of the secrets of divine health because that's God's will for us. So I pray that for you. I pray that in this next season, everyone watching this would come into a place of breakthrough in areas of health, especially as it pertains to just a sound heart. In 3 John 2, it says, that we would prosper and be in good health even as our soul prospers. So my prayer for you, for me, for all of us, prosperity of soul, our internal world would be healthy. Amen. Bless you. All of you that would say, I just, I really need more joy in my life. Well, here it is. A person has joy because of the answer of their mouth. You're presented with a challenge, a question, a problem, a difficulty. What's the answer? Your answer determines your measure of joy. I think it's a big deal for us to take responsibility for managing our own soul in that realm, that healthy area of joy. You and I were designed for great joy. Hello again, welcome back. Uh, once again, I really am thrilled that, uh, that you're able to join us in this quest for wisdom. Chapter 15 is where we're going today, so let's just get, let's get started. Verse 4 is where we'll start uh, today. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. The tree of life is mentioned three in three books of the Bible, in Genesis, in Proverbs, and in Revelation. Genesis is what was, Revelation is what will be, but Proverbs reveals what is a present tense reality. And the thing you need to remember about the tree of life is it marked, it marks whoever touches it with their eternal purpose. So when it says a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, that means it is possible through our speech, I don't want to say to create the reality, but to agree with the reality God has created for us that we get to tap in now to our eternal purpose. We get to speak life and death is in the power of the tongue. We get to speak life and death over our children, our grandchildren, our friends. We are able to speak even over cities, over businesses, things that bring great strength and great courage, and more importantly, help to define or help people to realize God's eternal purpose in each of these things. And so a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. You have the ability to speak the words of God that mark people with the reason they were created. That's a pretty significant task. Let's move on to, um, to verse uh, 13. Verse 13 says, A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. Now I want to take verse 15 as well because we'll put these two together. Verse 15 is, all the days of the afflicted are evil. He who has a merry heart has a continual feast. All right, so let's read these two together, 13 and 15. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he who, has a, uh, he who is of a merry heart has a continual feast. All right, here's, here's the deal. If the afflicted versus the merry heart or the sorrow that breaks the spirit is compared to a cheerful countenance. If, if those are just, this is your lot in life, you're just born with a, a happy nature versus an afflicted nature, then that, this would be cruel. This, this would be a cruel confrontation of the realities that you and I are stuck with. The only reason it's brought in here is because these are choices. It's actually decisions that we make and what we think and what we talk about. We actually help to determine the nature of the prosperity of our own soul. We draw from truth and make that our confession, our prayer, 
our decrees. Sometimes we just need to stop and just just declare things like, God, I trust in you. I don't know what's going on in this situation, but my trust is in you. Sometimes it has to be spoken. It can't just be a nice, happy, warm, fuzzy thought. It's got to be a decree. And you and I need to take responsibility for the moment that God's put us in and make the divine decrees. Why? Because we're the ones who decide. Do we have the cheerful heart? that actually becomes manifest. Did you know in scripture, the Bible actually teaches that nations will turn to God because of the joy that is in the heart of the believer. It's actually in the Psalms that nations will turn because they see what God has done for his people and the joy that's in their uh, on their countenance that captures their attention. That's where we're at. And I believe that uh, uh, joy is expected when you just won the lottery. Joy is expected when you just got the raise or you just had a healthy baby child. Joy is expected. When you have joy in the middle of adversity, that's when you capture the attention of the people around you. So let's determine we're going to be tree of life people, people that decree what God is saying. All right, let's move on quickly. Um, Here's an interesting one, verse 23. I, we, we keep getting back to this thing about our speech, but it's because it's all through here. And uh, this one stands out to me strong. It says, a man has joy by the answer of his mouth. Is it possible that the joy level that we live in was determined by our conversation and our decrees? Is it possible Though all of you that would say, I just, I really need more joy in my life. Well, here it is. A person has joy because of the answer of their mouth. You're presented with a challenge, a question, a problem, a difficulty. What's the answer? Your answer determines your measure of joy. I think it's a big deal for us to take responsibility for managing our own soul in that realm, that healthy area of joy. You and I were designed for great joy. Hey Amen. I'm about ready to preach here. All right, how are we doing for time? Oh, look at that. we got all kinds of time. All right, let's see. Let's move on. And um, I like verse 28. I was just pondering this uh, last night because it, it caught me off guard. It says in verse 28, it says, the heart of the righteous studies how to answer. And, uh, and uh, it was the word studies that caught me off guard. So I looked it up, and it's the same word that's used in various places in the Old Testament for the word meditate. It means to murmur or to mutter. And so biblical meditation, if you've been to the Wailing Wall or you've seen pictures of, of the Jews who stand at the wall and they're, they're bouncing back and forward, that's actually a physical, it's almost like a physical act of meditation where they're, they are reciting and repeating and uttering, muttering certain statements and phrases. The righteous do that in their heart of hearts on how to answer, on what to say, on how to phrase things. I want to make sure that I communicate well. I want to make sure that I communicate accurately. And the righteous do that right there. They rehearse what to say. Now let's go to the last verse. All right, um, it's verse 30. The light of the eyes rejoices the heart, and a good report make the bones healthy. There's another one. I don't know. You just can't get too much good news. that It actually affects our health. It actually affects our health. The bones become healthy. We have to take this as the word of the Lord. And sometimes you just have to go out of your way. Sometimes uh, things are so challenging. We've got uh, things that we're facing in our home right now, health-wise, that are quite serious, quite significant. And so we go out of our way to find the good news, the report of the Lord. Why? Because a good report makes the bones healthy. I pray that for you again, this issue of divine health, this issue of good news, bringing life to every part of our being, I pray that it would be multiplied to you over and over and over again. Yep, amen, amen, bless you. We all wanna see cities saved. It starts right here. How do you manage your own world? Your self-talk, what you think about, what you meditate on, what do you feed your soul on? Those are the things that actually position us for influencing cities. Well, hello once again. Welcome back. Our quest for wisdom 
Um, it's really a key for life for each of us to reign in life over the challenges, the difficulties of life, and really illustrate the lordship of Jesus in everything we do. And it's the great privilege of life. So welcome. Um, we're in chapter 16 today, and I've got another challenge today because I've got a couple things in here that are quite large. Uh, so I'm going to have to touch on them somewhat briefly, but uh, hopefully they'll ignite something in you where you can study on your own. Let's just begin quickly with verse 1. Verse 1 of chapter 16 says, The preparations of the heart belong to the man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. That's interesting. The preparations of the heart belong to man. The answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Here's the deal. If you'll watch over your heart, as it says in chapter 4, verse 23, if you'll prepare your heart to walk in purity, to walk in strength, you will never lack the word of the Lord that you need to speak into a given situation. The answer of the tongue is from the Lord. You take care of this part, he'll make sure you have the right thing to say. Perhaps you remember when Jesus was talking to his own disciples, he said, you'll be into a difficult situations where political leaders and such will be um, asking you questions. Don't worry about what you're going to say in that moment because the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. That's what's happening here. But in Proverbs, he gives you the step preceding that. He says, you prepare the heart. You make sure that you're in a place of surrender of yieldedness, the willingness to obey, and he'll make sure you have the right word in a given situation. All right, let's move on. Verse 3, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. That's interesting. Commit your works to the Lord. All right, let's just uh, say uh, at your place of employment, you have five projects that you're working on. It's where you, you think through these projects, these assignments that you have, and you commit each task to the Lord. And the reward is your thoughts will be established. What does that mean? It means your thoughts will be established um, established as, as a foundation. Your thoughts will constructively contribute to the works that you need to take care of. In other words, it's this co-laboring role that we have with him. If you'll commit your works to the Lord, the things that you have to do, he'll work with you in your thoughts so that what you think of actually contributes to what you're committed to. See, Jesus cares about this stuff. He cares about, you know, the car that you repair for a living. He cares about the homes that you build or the, the, the surgery that you perform as a doctor. He cares about each of these things. And when we commit our works to the Lord, he, he inspires us to think creatively to contribute to each of the things we've been assigned to do. Okay, moving on quickly. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right down to the big one. And this literally is a big one because I, I took a book to write about it. And it's verse 15. And so let's see how we do for time-wise here. In the light of a king's face is life, and his favor is like a cloud of latter rain. <sighs> In the light of a king's face is life, and his favor is like a cloud of latter rain. When we talk about rain, latter rain, throughout Scripture, Old New Testament, New, uh, Old Testament, latter rain, crops, New Testament, it was prophetically dealing with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So when I see verses like this, I automatically think, all right, what can this help me to understand as it pertains to the mighty outpourings of God, what he plans to do in the last days? In the light of a king's face is life, and his favor is like a cloud of latter rain. Here's the verse that um, I, I felt the Lord uh, tied together for the, with this passage for me many years ago when I was writing about uh, the quest for the face of God, the face to face with God. And it's in uh, Exodus 39 verse 29, and I'll just read it to you. I will not hide my face from them any more, for I shall have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, says the Lord. Think about this. I'll not hide my face from them any longer. Why? Because I will have poured out my spirit upon them. What is he saying? I'm not going to hide my face from them. Why? 
because in the outpouring of the Spirit is the face of God. This is significant. In every great move of God, the face of God is revealed. You say, well, I don't see the face of God. Yeah, the clarity with which we see is determined by our tendency to create form or idols or routines after what we've seen instead of truly responding to the face of God. That's actually what the Lord spoke to Israel. He said, I hid my face in the cloud, but I didn't let you see any form because I knew you to be an idolatrous people and you'd create an idol after what you saw. So the clarity with which we see is often determined by that tendency to create form formulas, idols, if you will, routines that, are, that have lost the inspiration of the presence of God. So here is this verse in Proverbs uh, 16. This is the, the light of a king's face is life. We come before this king of kings and that delight of his face over you, over me, it's a life-giving delight. It's the father who delights in a child. It's the smile. It's the, it's the funny noises we make as parents or, or relatives of this, of this baby. We, we, we make these sounds of delight and joy over this child. That's what you have here. That is life. And then it says, and that favor is like latter rain. That favor is just like the outpouring of the Spirit. So here's the deal. The Scripture connects the face of God, the delight of God, with revival. That's really what it comes down to. It, it, it connects the whole issue of the outpouring of the Spirit with favor. I hope that in this next season, everyone watching this will become unusually aware of the Father's delight in you. We can never earn revival. We can never earn a move of God, but we can certainly prepare ourselves for it and discover his delight in us so that we position our hearts correctly. All right, let's move on real quickly. I'm going to wrap this up. We'll do one more verse, and this one's going to seem quite a bit out of, out of context of what we've been talking about uh, so far, but it's in verse 32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Now, I don't know what you do when you read Proverbs. Anytime I find a statement where, there's, where there is the conversation about influencing a city, my ears perk up. So here, what is he saying? He said, he who rules his own spirit, he who manages his own inner world well, has the strength, I'm going to put this in my terms, has the strength to take a city. We all want to see cities saved. It starts right here. How do you manage your own world, your self-talk, what you think about, what you meditate on, what do you feed your soul on? Those are the things that actually position us for influencing cities. My favorite story in this regard is a parable Jesus gave in Luke 19, where he talks about the, the ones who took minas, a sum of money, and, and invested and increased. And the guy who increased to 10 the Lord, in response to that, said, here, you now are in charge of 10 cities. In other words, your faithfulness with this natural thing positioned you to influence cities. I pray that for you. I pray that the Lord would take what's in your hand, what's in your wallet, and, uh, and enable you through faithful stewardship to manage your inner world well so that you can truly be those who influence entire cities. I bless you with that and for that. In Jesus' name, amen. The hour that we live in is an hour where good is called evil and evil is called good. I have to cultivate in my heart the value system he has. I refuse to call evil good just so that I sound you know, contemporary, just so that I sound like I'm, I'm in touch with culture. I don't want to be in touch with culture in the sense that it influences me. I literally just want the culture of heaven. Well, hello once again. Welcome back to uh, this quest for wisdom. We're all in this one together. And uh, we're doing chapter 17 today. And I, I think I'm just going to take two, maybe three verses out of this chapter again. One is a little bit different, a little bizarre. Uh, so give me a little bit of grace on this one. 
Um, but chapter 17 happens to have a lot to say about conversation again, about speech. And so I'm going to let you just pretty much read that one uh, on your own. But I, I want to get down here to verse uh, 7 uh, that we'll, we'll start this with. We'll do 7 and 8, but we'll do them separate. Excellent speech is not becoming to a fool, much less lying lips to a prince. That just fascinates me. Excellent speech. Um, in an earlier chapter, we talked about how the righteous studies to prepare his lips to speak what is right with accuracy, and I'm going to use the term excellence. It's just smart that we give ourselves to excellent speech. And excellent speech means there are certain things I won't talk about. Uh, I'll, I'll leave a room. I've been in many conversations where people just start talking about this or about that, and it's just not something I want to engage in. I don't want to engage my heart in. I don't want to engage my conversation in, so I'll, I'll walk out of a room. Guard your heart so that you protect the privilege of excellent speech coming out of your mouth. Verse 8 is the one that's a little bit bizarre, so let me read it to you. It says, a present, a, a gift, a present is a precious stone in the eyes of its possessor. Wherever he turns, he prospers. Uh, um a, a present, a gift. Uh, let's say that a very, very wealthy uh, person gave you, oh goodness, let's, let's go big, a $10 million uh, diamond. And, and he said, you have to carry this with you for 30 days. You can't wear it. You can't show it to anybody. But you have it in your pocket. You've got this, you've got this awareness that everywhere I go, I've got this incredibly valuable gift with me. And what does it do? It changes your awareness of who you are and what your assignment is. It's suddenly there's this significance added to your life. And it says this person who becomes aware of the gift that they carry becomes prosperous in everything they do. Why? I think it's because it changes our, our sense of importance. It changes our sense of, of uh, purpose. It changes our awareness of what God has actually given us to do when we realize we carry something that is so invaluable. And we have something far more invaluable than that, and that's the message of the gospel. We carry a gift. Now, uh, reading commentaries on this, uh, they will often say a present is a bribe. And so it's, it's a, a bribe gives somebody confidence in an evil situation. Um, maybe, maybe that's right. But then maybe it's being aware of the priceless gift that you carry actually gives you a, a confidence because you were sent by someone greater than you to represent him into a given situation. And it means you're going to prosper in anything and everything you do. So just consider that. Become aware of the treasure that you carry. It's the message of the gospel and it's the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life that increases our confidence in challenging situations. All right, let's move on. Verse 15 is, uh, is one that I, I, I wanted to uh, look at today as well. It says, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them are alike, are an abomination to the Lord. He who justifies the wicked and who condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. <sighs> the hour that we live in is an hour where good is called evil and evil is called good. I've never seen anything that closely resembles this hour that we live in. The righteous are called corrupt and every disgusting thing you can think of. And the wicked are exalted in culture. And this is just a warning. It doesn't mean I need to hate people. It doesn't mean that people become my enemy. But it does mean I have to cultivate in my heart the value system he has. I need to be able to recognize, all right, calling that good is wrong. I will not do that. I will not do that to gain favor at work. I will not do that to gain favor with my neighbors. I refuse to call evil good just so that I sound, 
you know, contemporary, just so that I sound like I'm, I'm in touch with culture. I don't want to be in touch with culture in the sense that it influences me. I literally just want the culture of heaven. And that's where you call good, good, and you call evil, evil. It is what it is. And no compromise is ever needed in your life or mine uh, to lower the standards of what is real, what is right, what is true. And then I want to uh, go down here. We'll end with one more verse. See how we're doing for time? Yep, one more verse. And this is... um, in verse 22, and this is something that uh, in recent weeks I've brought up to you before, and I'm going to do it again because we need to get it down. Uh, It's in the book of Proverbs over and over and over again because he wants to make sure we learn it. All right, here it is, verse 22. A merry heart does good like medicine. A broken spirit dries up the bones. Let's take the negative first. A broken spirit, that inner world, They become so traumatized through crisis difficulty that doesn't, here's the deal, all of us face uh, loss, all of us face disappointment, all of us face that stuff, so there's no options there, we all face it. Mourning is going to take me either to the comforter, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, so it either takes me to the comforter or it takes me to unbelief. And if I allow the brokenness of life to take me into a place of resistance, then that's me right there. The broken spirit dries up the bones. It actually affects my health, my mental health, my emotional health, and eventually the body begins to break down and illustrate what's going on. I remember years ago praying for this gal that had Crohn's disease. And I just I just asked her randomly, I said, Do you, are you hard on yourself? Because Crohn's is where the body's basically attacking itself. Uh, are, are you are you harsh on yourself? She said, oh, yeah, I'm a college student, and I'm very critical, self-critical about grades and all that stuff. And I said, well, how about we repent for that? And she had to think for like seven years. We, uh, I led her in a prayer of repentance, and within moments she was completely healed of something that afflicted her for years. Why? Because our body sometimes is shouting to us what's going on in our inner, our internal world. So here it is, a merry heart. It's a choice. A merry heart does good like medicine. Maybe we should have uh, at all of our pharmacies one counter that just is the merry heart counter. Counter. We we'll make sure that we go and receive good news and good reports and replenish our soul so that we come into a place of great strength and great personal health. I pray that for you. I, I pray that, that you and I together can illustrate divine health uh, really as an invitation to the world to come to know this Jesus who is absolutely a perfect father. All right, bless you. Thanks for joining. I bless you.